Moving straight on, the next item of business is a stage one debate on motion 11350 in the name of Kevin Stewart on Housing Amendment Scotland Bill. I can invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. Call on Kevin Stewart to speak and move the motion. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I'm pleased to open this stage one debate in the general principles of the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill. Uh, I'd like to th uh, begin by thanking the convener and the members of the Local Government and Communities Committee uh, for their careful scrutiny of the bill so far. And I very much welcome the committee's stage one report with its recommendation to the Parliament that the general principles of the bill be agreed to. I hope that the Scottish Government's response to the report provides the committee uh, with the assurance it was seeking uh, from us. And I'd also like to thank the clerks for their work and support of the committee and all the stakeholders who gave evidence to the committee. Can I particularly thank the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations who have worked closely with us throughout. I'm pleased that stakeholders not only recognise the need for the bill, but also very much support the principles of the bill and have worked with us throughout the process of the bill so far. And I look forward to continuing that as the bill moves towards its end. The bill is relatively short, but essential measure that amends a number of the powers that the Scottish Housing Regulator can exercise over registered social landlords. It also provides for ministers to limit local authorities' powers over housing associations. It's necessary because of the decision by the Office for National Statistics to classify RSLs as public sector bodies in the national accounts. That decision was taken because the ONS, in light of the criteria that it must uh, apply in classification decisions, judged that some of the powers the regulator and local authorities may exercise over RSLs amount to public control of RSLs for the purposes of the national accounts. If left unchanged, it would mean that all new net borrowing by RSLs which previously would have counted as private borrow borrowing, would count against the Scottish Government's borrowing limits. Therefore, uh, while classification may appear to be just a technical matter, it would have the real and significant consequence of placing a new and permanent burden on the finances of the Scottish Government. One result would be that the borrowing by RSLs to support our affordable housing programme would no longer count as private borrowing. It would count as government borrowing, effectively adding £1.5 billion to our £3 billion investment uh, in the programme, putting at risk our target of 50,000 new affordable homes during the life of this parliament. As RSLs are independent of the Scottish Government, they are free to determine with their private lenders how much they borrow. So reclassification uh, would lead to the consequence of the Scottish Government needing to accommodate RSL's borrowing within its budget, but without being able to control or limit the level or extent of that borrowing. The purpose of the bill is to avoid that outcome by ensuring that powers the regulator and local, local authorities have over RSLs are consistent uh, with RSLs being classified as private sector bodies. Uh, for the most part, the bill achieves this by uh, amending those of the regulator's powers that ONS uh, identified as public control over RSLs. It narrows the circumstances in which the regulator can appoint a manager to an RSL and in what, which it can remove, suspend or appoint an officer to a, an RSL. And it removes the regulator's powers to give or withhold consent to actions by RSLs, such as disposing of their assets or restructuring themselves. The changes are necessary uh, because, put at its simplest, the powers they amend currently enable the regulator to act as though it were the actual owner of RSLs. And that crosses the line between what the regulator, as a public body, is able to do in respect of bodies that are classified as private and what is incompatible uh, with the classification. Uh, whilst these changes are significant, uh, they go just as far as necessary, necessary to secure reclassification, but no further than that. They do not alter the regulator's single statutory objective, which remains safeguarding and promoting the interests of homeless people, tenants of social landlords, and others who use the services of social landlords. And they leave intact the majority of the regulator's powers. And that includes powers to monitor, assess, and report on how well all social landlords are performing, 
set standards on RSL's financial health and governance, undertake investigations, and where necessary, require landlords to take remedial action. These and other remaining powers will allow the regulator to continue safeguarding and promoting the interests of tenants and homeless people, not least by reassuring private lenders that RSLs remain attractive businesses to lend to. Through my engagement with the SFHA and the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations, I've been encouraged to hear that they recognise that this represents a new challenge for their members and that they are ready to step up to it. They recognise in particular that removing the regulator's powers of consent over matters such as disposals and restructurings will place a greater onus on all of their members to demonstrate to their lenders that they have robust and rigorous governance procedures in place. The committee highlighted this in stage one of the report, and I know that SFHA and the forum are keen to work with the regulator to ensure that the current review of its regulatory fra framework helps to strengthen further the governance arrangements already in place. In our response to the report, we confirmed that we will use our regular discussions with the SFHA and the GWSF to confirm that the sector gives proper weight to this important matter for example, through the provision of continuous training and development of, of the members of the governing bodies. We've also worked, presiding officer, with UK Finance to address their concerns and in response to the committee's recommendations, we will bring forward amendments that will provide for the regulation making powers at sections 8 and 9 of the bill to expire three years after the bill receives royal assent. Presiding officer, this bill is necessary to safeguard the Scottish Government's finances and our ambitious affordable housing programme, and I'm pleased that it commands cross-party support. I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I call on Bob Doris to speak on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee. Mr Doris, five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to open this debate on the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee. I want to thank all those who contributed to our scrutiny of what is mainly a technical bill. It is worth highlighting from the outset that there was general agreement amongst those we heard from that the measures in the bill are a proportionate and nested response to the Office of National Statistics, the ONS decision to categorise registered social landlords, RSLs, as public bodies. The bill's Proposals are intended to ensure that the ONS reclassifies RSLs as private bodies by removing or limiting some of the Scottish Housing Regulator's powers of intervention. The bill also provides ministers with powers to alter the regulation's powers in future in order to ensure RSLs are reclassified as private bodies. Those we heard from agreed that there would be no other way of achieving these aims other than this bill. If RSLs were to remain as public bodies, their borrowing to build new affordable homes would no longer be considered as private borrowing, but be brought onto the Scottish Government's books, potentially adding £1.5 billion in debt. This could have severe implications on RSLs' contribution to realising the Government's commitment of 50,000 affordable homes. We therefore agreed that the measures proposed in the Bill were necessary, but noted that a few issues raised during our scrutiny needed to be addressed. The Information Commissioner was concerned that the removal of some of the regulator's powers could exempt RSLs from providing information under Environmental Information Regulations, EIRs. Whilst the Scottish Government proposes to bring RSLs under the terms of freedom of information, the Information Commissioner, Commissioner was concerned that there could be a short gap between enactment of the bill and the FOI changes then being implemented. This gap would mean the EIRs would not apply to RSLs thus stopping people's ability to request such information during that time. The Information Commissioner wasn't able to say with certainty that this risk would arise now, but he has to reach a decision at the time when the issue arises. Both the SFHA and the Glasgow West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations assured the committee that they would encourage and direct RSLs where possible to continue providing EIRs during any such gap period. On that basis, and with those assurances and the relatively low level of risk involved, we agreed that less formal arrangements to ensure that RSLs continue to provide this information is a more proportionate response than changing the bill. Now, sections one and two of the bill narrow the circumstances in which the regulator can intervene where an RSL has failed and also limit the circumstances in which it can remove or appoint managers or officials to an RSL. Most agreed the measures were appropriate, with some saying the proposed measures would reflect how powers had actually been used by the regulator historically. The regulator confirmed this. 
UK finance raised one issue in relation to these powers, commenting that the definition of failure could be broadened to make it clear that the regulator can intervene where the RSL is failing rather than at the point where, where it has failed or becomes insolvent. This, it felt, would ensure lender confidence within the market. The Scottish Government and regulator, however, allayed these concerns by pointing to the statutory provisions in the Housing Scotland Act 2010, which sets out regulatory interventions which the regulator will still be able to make following amendments made in the bill. And the committee welcomes the minister has now also uh, expanded explanatory notes to provide such clarity. Moving on to sections three through to seven of the bill, these provisions remove the requirement of the regulator to provide its consent to RSLs where they wish to dispose of land or make certain organisational changes. Such a change, uh, such a change in the constitution or restructuring or to wind up or dissolve an RSL. Consent is replaced with the requirement to notify the regulator within 28 days of the changes being made. Any existing tenant consultation requirements are protected. Uh, again, uh, the committee was broadly content that these proposals were balanced and we welcomed reassurances given. Uh, the importance of strong governance processes and its direct impact on the confidence of lenders and RSLs was highlighted to us. Whilst the bill removes some of the regulator's powers in relation to RSL's governance, it was encouraging to hear the, US, the UK finance were comforted by the measures that stakeholders and RSLs would take to ensure self-assurance processes were strong. Uh, in the time that I've got left, presiding officer, I would just like to say that there are some additional powers remaining within the bill in sections eight and nine to make sure that the government has got this just right and the power to intervene and make additional provisions if we haven't got this just right. Uh, the committee acknowledged and the government acknowledged that these powers don't have to stay there forever and they are now going to be subject at stage two to a sunset clause. We think that's proportionate, we think it's responsible, we think it's the right thing to do. So in closing, presiding officer, the Local Government Communities Committee are happy to agree to the general principles of this bill. Thank you very much. I call on Graham Simpson to open the Conservatives. Mr Simpson, four minutes, please. Thank you. Um, now, this is one of uh, those debates around a bill which uh, doesn't exactly set the heather on fire, uh, but which, which is important nonetheless. The Housing Amendment Scotland Bill looks on the face of it to be quite narrow and technical. A bit dull, you might think, presiding officer. But while it does deal with quite specific accounting issues of interest to accountants, its implications will be far-reaching. If this bill does not go through, and I'm sure it will, then it would make it extremely difficult for housing associations to deliver their part in meeting the government's affordable homes target. Now, while that might give opposition spokesmen like me an oppor opportunity to kick Kevin Stewart, which can be quite enjoyable, it would not, it would not be very responsible. So we'll be supporting the bill at this stage and beyond. I think it's useful to put what this is all about into plain English. I'll have a go anyway. Registered social landlords, housing associations were classed as private bodies for accounting purposes until the Office for National Statistics decided to change their status to public bodies. And the effect of this is that any borrowing they do counts against the Scottish Government's borrowing limits, which in turn means that the government might have to limit what RSLs can borrow, which would not be good. You can see the problem. But in order to remove those shackles, you would have to reclassify RSLs as private sector bodies. However, you'd not expect a private sector body to be so tightly regulated as our housing associations are by the housing regulator. That level of public sector control was one of the reasons behind the ONS switch in the first place. So you can see where they were coming from. So if we're to take RSLs back into the private sector, then we also have to rein back on the regulator's powers. The bill tackles this, with the end result being that housing associations will enjoy more freedoms and be able to deliver more. So it is technical, but it is important. Now, it's fair to say there hasn't been a great deal of interest in this outside of the sector. The Local Government and Communities Committee only had 16 responses to its call for evidence, compared to over 1,000 on the planning bill, but then that is a lot more controversial. People were generally supportive of the proposals. Briefly, they narrow the powers of the regulator to appoint a manager to an RSL, 
and to remove, suspend and appoint officers of an RSL. They remove the need for the regulator's consent to the disposal of land and housing assets by an RSL, any changes to the constitution of, of an RSL and the voluntary winding up, dissolution and restructuring of an RSL. They provide Scottish ministers with regulation making powers to limit the in influence that a local authority has over an RSL. Now the committee made a number of recommendations uh, and I'm pleased that it took on board the concerns of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee around sections eight and nine of the bill, which have already been mentioned, which cover ministers' regulation making powers. The DPLR committee considered that in principle, the powers could be framed more narrowly. The minister agreed to add a sunset clause to both those sections and he hoped that this and his assertion that the powers would only be used for limited means would address the concerns raised by the DPLR committee and indeed they do. Overall, it's a sensible bill. It should proceed without fuss through its stages and I commend it to the Parliament. And Mr Simpson, I understood your explanation, so thank you for putting it in simple English. I call on Monica Lennon. Four minutes, please. Well, the bar's been uh, raised. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased to be opening for Scottish Labour in this afternoon's Stage 1 debate on the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill and to state our support for the bill. I was worried that there would be a lot of repetition uh, in this debate, but let's just call it consensus. I think we're going to be saying lots of similar things. And like uh, other colleagues, I'm also a member of the Local Government and Communities Committee, which has produced a stage one report on this bill. Um, I joined the committee late, just at the beginning of, of this year, as the work on the bill was drawing to a close. So I must pay tribute to the convener, my fellow uh, committee members, and Elaine Smith, MSP, my predecessor as deputy convener on the committee, who will be speaking later in the debate. Scottish Labour support this bill because I think like everyone in the chamber um, we agree that it's necessary and we understand that it's, it's, it's a proportionate response to ensure that registered social landlords debt does not affect the government's ability to borrow money and build affordable housing which is so desperately needed across Scotland. Following the decision from the Office of National Statistics to reclassify RSLs as public sector bodies in the UK national accounts back in 2016, this bill has become necessary to ensure that RSLs can be declassified as private sector bodies as they were previously. And as we've heard, and as the Minister explained in his opening speech, if left unchanged, this would mean that any borrowing undertaken by social landlords would be counted as borrowing by the Scottish Government. And this government borrowing is limited to £450 million per year and £3 billion in total. This could potentially lead to a situation where restrictions would have to be placed on how much RSLs can borrow. So as we've heard, this bill seeks to make changes to the powers that the Scottish Housing Regulator has over RSLs in relation to their management, governance and how they, bu they buy and sell land. Reducing the powers of the regulator over RSLs will allow the Office of National Statistics to reclassify RSLs as private sector bodies as they were, as they were before. Um, as we've also heard from the convener, the majority of the evidence received by the Local Government Communities Committee has been supportive of these proposals, including evidence from the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations and the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations too. And, you know, unlike other bills, you know, there, there wasn't really any need to consult widely. So I think the government took uh, a sensible approach to engage directly with the regulator and the groups and bodies who you know, represent those who are likely to be affected by the bill's proposals, including um, tenant groups. Uh, so, the, so there does appear to be broad agreement between stakeholders and the regulator that changes to the regulator's powers will reflect actual practice and that the narrowing of powers will not hamper interventions where necessary. Some concerns had been raised about the bill that it could potentially weaken safeguards or have unintended impact that landlords could fall out of the scope of environmental information regulations, um, something again that, that Bob Doris has highlighted. Um, so we welcome that the Scottish Government has confirmed that they will look into making RSL subject to Freedom of Information uh, Act should it be deemed a case that they will fall out of environmental 
Information Scotland Regulations 2004 obligations. The fact that there would still be a gap between the implementation of the bill and FOI um, does remain a, a concern, but um, I think you know, we're all keen that the government um, will work with us to resolve that as the bill progresses. In conclusion, the conclusion, presiding officer, Scottish Labour uh, is happy to support the principles of the bill at decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Call Andy Whiteman to open for the Green Party. Mr Whiteman, please. Thank you, presiding officer. How long do I have? I beg your pardon? How long do I have, presiding officer? Four minutes, please. Four minutes, goodness me. <laughs> uh, Is that too much? Well, we'll, 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 see how, we'll see how we get on. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and stay within scope. Um, uh, thanks, presiding officer. Um, I mean, like other speakers and indeed my colleagues on the committee, I recognise the uh, purpose uh, of this bill and, and, and agree with it. I also, I think I agree with everything the minister said in his opening remarks. Uh, it's always a first time for everything and uh, what my convener said um, as well. Um, so we will be voting for this bill at decision time, uh, and therefore I want to use my four minutes <laughs> um, to discuss, discuss some wider aspects of housing associations, which I think our deliberations on this bill um, began to raise in my mind uh, anyway. So in the 1970s, community-based housing associations and co-ops began to flourish in Glasgow mainly, um, working to improve the life in the city's uh, tenements to, to better uh, manage it and improve uh, tenement housing. And this was a very welcome uh, model of cooperation, which I think 40 years later we do well to reflect on in terms of promoting more cooperative approaches uh, to housing provision. Housing associations themselves have played an important role in the housing story um, since the recognition of registered housing associations in the Housing Scotland Act 1974. Uh, and it's important, I think, to, to acknowledge uh, in a debate like this the good work of uh, housing associations, in particular rural social landlords such as Lochaber Housing Association uh, and Waverley Housing Association in the Scottish borders, uh, as well as the urban organisations that house a large number of tenants in our towns and cities. And it's there where we find our largest housing associations, like the Wheatley Group, who include 12 business interests, including Dunedin, Canmore and Glasgow Housing Association, and which last year reported a turnover of £275 million. Pounds, and in the course of their uh, work, they housed 250,000, and I quote, customers uh, across Scotland. So while today we affirm the value and validity of housing associations as private organisations, I think it's appropriate to raise a question about where these organisations and where this model is headed. For example, I think we should differentiate between smaller organisations who tend to use terms like tenants and larger operators like Wheatley who talk about customers. And when we had the housing regulator chair in before the committee in November uh, last year, uh, I put it to him um, that in, in his report he'd highlighted the declining, diminishing tenant participation in the larger housing associations compared to the small ones. Which brings me back to my opening point about it being time perhaps to consider moving towards a more genuine cooperative model for housing in the social sector. And in the Minister's appearance before the committee in December, he warned that this bill, if it didn't proceed, then the 50,000 affordable home target would be at risk, and that's true, and this bill overcomes that. So while I don't dispute that, I think we also need to remember that half of the government's affordable housing programme, at one and a half billion, is funded by social tenants. Many of these households are amongst the financially poorest citizens in this country, and I think it's incumbent on us to acknowledge that. So, presiding officer, as I've argued, we should not ignore the role of tenants as full participants in housing associations. It's these individuals who are vital to the success of these organisations in Scotland, which is why I regret the fact that in many cases they don't participate to the level uh, they do. I think there's room for improvement in that, and I think these shortcomings are particularly important in light of the fact that this bill does weaken the public oversight of housing associations. So, presiding officer, in conclusion, I agree uh, with the general principles of the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill. Greens will be supporting it in decision time, and I look forward to stage two. Thank you very much. There is a little time in hand. I've been a bit naughty. I, uh, yes, yes, I have my, I have my naughty moments. Uh, I call Richard Lyle to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Well, I'm going to go at all that time. Thanks very much, presiding officer. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak on an issue which is important to all our constituents, including mine in Uddingston 
in Belsil. The bill before us today concerns responsible allocation of funds in relation to the debt limit of the Scottish Government, and it is to this end that I wish to begin my remarks in the Chamber today. I have no doubt that anyone in this Chamber would fail to recognise what an emotional subject housing is, and rightly so. I also feel quite confident to say that most of us would agree that Scotland needs more public housing. This bill is, sim is simply a reasonable administrative necessity. Yes, I will. Andy Whiteman. Uh, the member says we need more public housing, but of course this bill uh, classifies housing associations as private organisations. So does he agree with me that as well as more housing associations talk, we actually do need more public housing run by councils? Richard every, Lyle. Every house, every house that is built is a house that houses a family. You know that as well as I do. It's acknowledged by the ONS Office of National Statistics. If we do not vote to pass this bill, then RSLs, registered social landlords, will continue to be classified as public sector bodies in the national accounts. Resulting in all new net borrowing by RSLs would count against the government's borrowing requirements. To allow this to happen would be to allow a significant, permanent and most of all needless burden on the Scottish Government's finances. I'm sure that this Chamber does care about the Scottish Government's ability to, to pay for services that Scottish people rely on and needs no more convincing than this as it is a simple argument. That a Government needs, to all, to, needs all available funds to fulfil its obligations Therefore, Parliament ought to take steps to solve the problem of classifying RSLs as public sector bodies by passing this bill. Not passing this bill would have an immediate implication for the Scottish Government's commitment to build homes, homes for families. This is because our commitment depends on the Government's planned financial support of over £3 billion for a programme being augmented by the RSL sector undertaking private borrowing by some £300 million a year. Moreover, if RSL's borrowing can no longer be counted as private borrowing, the effective cost of the Scottish Government of delivering on the commitment would, by having to include the RSL borrowing, would rise to £4.5 billion, which of course is £1.5 billion over budget, as already has been said. This policy is simple to policies pursued by the same reason by the UK Government, as well as the Northern Ireland Executive and the uh, Welsh Assembly governments in their respective jurisdictions. Under this bill, RSLs will no longer be classified by the government as public sector bodies. Any funds which they borrow will therefore not come out of the government's limited budget and we will remain able to fulfil our obligations to all our constituents, including making good on our promise of 50,000 new and affordable homes. And I commend this bill to this chamber. Thank you, President Officer. I call Jeremy Balford, followed by Alec Rowley. Mr Balford, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, last night, uh, I was trying to put uh, my uh, two girls to bed, and great excitement as today's the last day of term. And in the end, uh, I said, do you want me to tell you what I'm talking about in the Parliament tomorrow? I said, I'm talking about the Housing Amendment Scotland Act, or Bill. Suddenly, silence fell in the room, and I was able to leave them as they didn't want to seem to engage in this vital subject. Graham <laughs> <laughs> um, Simpson. In order to get your girls to bed, did you read them my speech? <laughs> yeah. Jeremy Balfour. Even more exciting, I referred him to the minister's biography, which really got them overly excited. Uh, however, uh, joking apart, uh, this uh, bill, um, of all technical, and of all I suspect uh, is not are going to be remembered uh, by most of Scotland in the years to come is actually very important, as uh, members um, have already mentioned. And with your uh, permission, Deputy President Officer, I'd like to go off slightly from the bill, but stay to this uh, particular subject. Uh, before I uh, entered this chamber nearly two years ago, I worked uh, for a small charity which tried to uh, get more uh, affordable housing built in Scotland by using um, empty church buildings or redeveloping church buildings um, into housing. Uh, and through that, we work very closely with many um, housing associations um, across Scotland. Uh, and I think my general view is, is that housing associations um, are doing a great job and are working along with Scottish Government to see if they can get the 50,000 affordable houses built uh, within the next few years. And it's something I'm sure 
all of us welcome. But I do hope that these powers that housing associations are going to be given by this to allow them uh, to borrow and, and, and to be able to do different accountancy procedures will also encourage some housing associations who perhaps are becoming slightly uh, conservative with a small c in regard to their building um, perspectives. A number of housing associations I came across um, were scared to go ahead and build more housing uh, for lots of different reasons. Uh, and I do think there is a responsibility on them to work with uh, their communities, to work with Scottish Government, to work with local authorities. Sorry. Minister. It's in everybody's interest to get housing associations to develop if they have the confidence to do so. Um, if Mr uh, Balfour wants to outline some of the reasons that he came across and send them to me, I will look at that. Obviously, my officials will help as much as they can uh, in terms of giving housing associations uh, the knowledge and the help uh, to set them on the development track if that's what they want to do. So I'd be quite happy to hear from Mr Balfour about those reasons for lack of development in certain places. Jeremy Balfour. I, I certainly will uh, take uh, the Minister up on um, his kind offer and, and do that after recess. But I think this type of bill will allow um, housing associations greater confidence to go forward. Um, and I think it is in all our interest to see more affordable houses built, both within this region of Lothian, mm -hmm. but across the whole of Scotland. Uh, for that reason, uh, Deputy President Officer, um, I do welcome uh, this bill. I welcome that there is a, a cross-party consensus on it. Um, I hope it gets through the final two stages uh, quickly so that we can move on and we can see housing associations flourish as we seek to serve uh, everybody across the whole of Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you. Call Alec Rowley to follow by Stuart Stevenson. Kevin Stewart uh, and what he had to say in moving this, this bill today. The fact is, as the Minister said, the plan 50,000 affordable houses, 35,000 of which are for social rent, could be put in jeopardy if this bill did not go ahead. And we cannot allow that to happen because we should remember that even with those figures, we face still have a housing crisis in Scotland that has to be tackled. You know, last year there were over 34,000 homeless applications made in Scotland so that we can see even with those 35,000 social rented houses, if they're achieved, and I hope they are, in the five-year period, you know, it doesn't solve our housing crisis. 137,000 households on local authority housing waiting lists, 10,000, almost 11,000 households in temporary accommodation, 27% of them in bed and breakfast. Can we just imagine in this chamber young children sitting in their classroom, class size is 30, other children are getting on with their work and those children are wondering where they're going to be sleeping that night. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible that in 2018 in Scotland we have these housing problems, so we need to tackle them. The House Minister is often fond of reminding us, I think, that that over the period before his party came into government, I think he says there was eight council houses that were built, six, six. But it is interesting that between 1997 and 2007, there was 37,200 and odd houses built in the housing association sector. So there was a lot of progress made. And I was quite surprised to discover that there are almost 280,000 units of housing stock within the housing associations. So we can see that housing associations do make a massive contribution in Scotland. Um, the minister was a councillor, I was a councillor, and I know as a councillor, one of the most difficult things for me, and it's continued as an MSP, is people coming along to your surgeries people contacting you for help where they're either in housing that is not adequate or they don't have housing at all. And that's why I think, you know, it's good that we've got the unity today. 
Minister. Um, and I'm glad that we've got that unity today, presiding officer, because I think there are a lot of shared ambition uh, across this chamber in terms of the delivery um, of uh, affordable homes, homes for social rent across Scotland. Um, I recognise that um, in Mr Rowley's part of the world, um, Fife uh, have done extremely well in terms of adding to our programme in the previous parliamentary session and in this one. And I hope that that cooperation across parties in Fife and elsewhere in Scotland will continue so that we can resolve the, the problems that people have in terms of getting housing. Alec Rowley. Yeah, I think, I think we, we need to work together because of the issues that I outlined there. It's not acceptable that we have this housing crisis in Scotland. Every party should work together. The very basic right of having a roof over your head should be there for every individual person, every child and every family. So I'm pleased to work with the government on this. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson, then we move to closing speeches. Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me, uh, through the Chair, just say a couple of words to uh, uh, Andy Whiteman. He gave us a 40-year horizon uh, since uh, we, housing associations came into play. Well, there was the, uh, the digest of Justinian, which covered the uh, cooperative housing associations in ancient Rome, and indeed, uh, two and a half thousand years ago there were cooperative models in in babylon so we've come to the party quite late in 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 scotland i might suggest now members might uh, reasonably ask why i'm speaking in this debate um, i forced my way to the front of the long queue that the whips had drawn up uh, to fill the last speaking place from the government benches um, the temptation of course for my part was when i read in the committee report at paragraph 10 the bill is short and technical now the word and technical is what, of course, it inevitably draws me in. I, I, I think it's uh, fair to say that this is not the most contentious thing that we've debated uh, uh, since I came to Parliament in 2001. But it is quite interesting because it does illustrate some of the unintended side effects that come uh, from revising the way in which we do accounting, in particular uh, of, uh, uh, of, of bodies that have to report uh, their assets, liabilities, uh, uh, their income and expenditure. And I found in, uh, in 2001, uh, under the old FRS 17 accounting standard, uh, when I looked at the accounts for Kilmarnock Prison, because I was interested in prisons at that time, that because the PFI contractors Kilmarnock Prison uh, Limited uh, had a commitment in the 30-year contract that they had to pass the prison uh, to the government, they treated it as a disposal in the second year of trading. So it vanished off their balance sheet as an asset, but the, for the government concerned, it was not an asset in their balance sheet until 30 years hence when it appeared in their balance sheet. So you actually had a period of virtually 30 years where that asset appeared on nobody's balance sheet, and that was under the old system. Now, we, we're now under IF, IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standard. Uh, we now have uh, a new thing called contingent assets, which means it, in the similar circumstances, it's now on Kilmarnock Prison uh, Limited balance sheet and on the government's balance sheet. So it now appears on both balance sheets. But the bottom line about all this in relation to the issue that's before us today is that we need to get the right balance as to where things appear in our public accounting. Um, now, the problem that's been presented to us by the Office of National Statistics, a perfectly proper problem for them to present us with, is that were these, building, uh, uh, these associations in a place where they had sufficient freedom of action that they could control, manage, dispose, buy assets, uh, without the government telling them what to do. And that's a question. Um, the next uh, kind of question is, were they creating assets for the government? And the final question uh, is, were they, by their actions, creating uh, ill and voluntary liabilities, contingent or otherwise, for the government? And it was the uncertainties in these accounting areas that I think properly caused the Office of National Statistics to say, we've got these bodies out there that are connected to the public sector, although they're private bodies, as Mr. Whiteman reminded us, um, do they really 
form part of the public sector. And of course, that would inhibit government in its uh, spending plans and more fundamentally for the policy that we're interested in here, inhibit the ability of uh, these societies to borrow money and build housing. Because Alec Rowley is perfectly correct, we've got to build more houses, whatever we, what means uh, we do it by. And yes, I will. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Mr Stevenson for taking the intervention. I wonder, in reading about the bill, did he also come across comments by UK Finance where they said that the lenders might have to ramp up their due diligence, and I quote them directly, and, and I wonder what he thought about that particular point that was being made. Well, and and uh, concluding, please. I was very pleased that uh, UK Finance uh, got themselves to a position of supporting what's proposed initially. I, I gather there was a bit of doubt. Uh, presiding officer, I, I think uh, Elaine Smith makes a very valid point. Whenever you change the system, you cre risk creating more complexities. And if that gets in the way of our building more houses, making life more difficult for housing associations, that's not good news. But I think the bill strikes the right balance, presiding officer, and I shall be very happy to support it come decision time. Thank you. I call on Elaine Smith to close for Labour. Ms Smith, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And although I'm closing for Scottish Labour, can I just say that when this bill first came to the Local Government Communities Committee, I was actually the deputy convener of the committee. And therefore, I was involved in taking evidence on the bill. And I did at the time raise some concerns about some potential unintended consequences which might be encountered through narrowing the powers of the House and regulating. And I'll return to those a bit later. Um, as we've heard from the Minister, the committee convener, and I think most other contributors to the debate, the main thrust of the bill is to ensure that the borrowing ability of housing associations and other social landlords will not be counted as government borrowing, and that will be done by reducing the powers of the regulator over registered social landlords and allowing the ONS to reclassify them as private sector bodies, and it will also ensure that the debt accrued by registered social landlords doesn't become subject to further restrictions or limits as an unintended consequence of that earlier decision taken by the ONS, which reclassified registered social landlords as public sector bodies. Now, those of you who know me will be aware that I would not naturally be drawn to reclassifying a body from the public sector to the private sector. And I note uh, Andy Whiteman's comments in that regard as well. However, as we know, the consequences of not acting, which were set out very clearly in evidence to the committee, is that the Scottish Government's target of building more affordable homes could be negatively impacted almost immediately if unnecessary restrictions um, were required to be placed on the borrowing ability of RSLs. And I think that would also include a point, another point that Andy Whiteman made earlier. That would include perhaps an impact on the council house building, something also raised uh, by my colleague Alec Rowley and his contribution. And it's for that reason that there is broad consensus that this bill is necessary and of course it is why Scottish Labour uh, agree with the committee and will support its general principles. Jeremy Balfour and his contribution raised um, an interesting issue about housing associations and it brought to mind uh, a point around the right to buy actually because um, I was involved in that issue with the extension of right to buy to housing associations back in the day at the start of this parliament, uh, which, which was an issue for me. And of course, that, that's not an issue now, but it could have been something that would put off housing associations building more houses. Um, on the other issues of concern which have been raised about the bill, I agree that further work must be done to ensure there's no reduction in terms of the information that RSLs are required to provide to the public. Um, something that was raised during the, the committee stage. And I appreciate the expectation and view expressed by the SFHA and others that they would continue to expect their members to provide the information which they're currently required to do under the Environmental Information Regulations 2004. Nonetheless, it is still an issue of concern that should an unintended consequence of the bill be that registered social landlords fall out of the scope of the EIA, there might still be a gap in implementation between the passage of the bill and extension of the FOI act to apply to RSLs. Yeah, but I was just going to finish on saying that I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has committed to resolving this with the committee, as mentioned by Monica Lennon, but I'm happy to take the convener. Bob Doris. Thank you, Bob, Deputy Convener, uh, for, for taking the intervention. It wouldn't be ideal, but even if the gap is very small, once FOI comes in, in theory, those 
could be just resubmitted under FOIs and the information would still be given out. But hopefully that won't arise and housing associations will just deal with the spirit of the legislation before us. Thank, Thank you, President Officer, and I'm sure the, the committee will be um, taking that on board at the next stage as well and, and keeping an eye on it. Um, at committee, I also raised the issue that increased self-assessment for registered social landlords runs the risk of increased costs for RSLs and that there's an implication that local authorities will have reduced influence on housing association boards with an associated impact on council's duties toward housing targets and reducing homelessness. And I'm glad that the, the minister has agreed to monitor this um, in particular and in particular to ensure the right approach to tackling homelessness with the partnership and cooperation of RSLs. Um, and in that regard, I think Andy Whiteman's comments were also interesting and I look forward to seeing how he takes that forward. Um, in conclusion, presiding officer, the Scottish Government has said that without the bill, there would be a significant permanent burden on the Scottish Government finances and controls on how much RSLs can borrow. So although it's been a fairly technical debate, um, and maybe not, as uh, Graeme Simpson said, setting the heather on fire, However, the consequences could be real for government spending, for housing waiting lists and for homeless people. So it's an important piece of legislation. And as a former homelessness officer, I feel very strongly about that. So, presiding officer, as I've said, Scottish Labour will be happy to support the bill at decision time. Thank you very much. I call now Alexander Stewart, close to the Conservatives, please, Mr Stewart. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm very pleased to be participating in this stage one debate this afternoon and to be closing on behalf of the Conservatives. It's been good to hear the contributions from members across the chamber supporting the principles of the bill and the consensus that we have in the chamber is most encouraging. And as a member of the committee, I thank all those who have worked so far on the bill and look forward to it proceeding. We in the Scottish Conservatives are supportive of the bill. Uh, we understand the reasons behind it and acknowledge that. And as colleagues have said this afternoon, I mean, Graham Simpson talked about how important the bill was, uh, how it, would, it had to go through. Uh, that government and SLAs uh, had uh, a sensible approach to what was happening, and that's most important. Monica talked, Lennon talked about the powers and the management and the governance that requires to be taking place. Uh, and Jeremy Balfour touched on the housing association's lack of building and development and the fear that they had. Uh, and that's something that we need to take on board. And I do look forward to some dialogue with the housing minister on that as we progress. As other members have indicated, this is a necessary change since the Office of National Statistics reclassified our housing associations as public bodies, which has meant that any borrowing undertaken by uh, the, towards the Scottish Government's borrowing limits. At present, Scottish housing associations privately borrow around 300 million each year, and that's around two thirds of the Scottish Government's capital borrowing limit. Without any changes to the current situation, it is highly likely that the Scottish Government will be forced into imposing controls on borrowing by housing associations. And that's not anything that any of us want to take place, presiding officer. The situation could put the Scottish Government's target of building at least 50,000 affordable homes over the course of this parliament in danger. Uh, as a party, we support the goal uh, and failure to meet that target uh, has to be uh, a challenge and we make, must make sure that that is not a, uh, an opinion that takes place. We need these houses and we need these houses now. To ensure that that is not the case, it is therefore essential the Office of National Statistics is able to reclassify housing associations as private bodies once again. The bill does exactly that by reducing and removing certain powers of the regulator and therefore we are happy to support that. In addition, in keeping with the aim of the move forward, the redesignation of housing associations as public sector bodies, it's welcome to see the proposals in section nine of the bill to limit uh, authorities' control over them. Giving ministers regular to making powers or limiting or removing the influence of councils can have over housing associations is another necessary step to tackle this issue. These steps are very important that we ensure that that does take place. All of this is not to say, however, presiding officer, that registered social landlords do not need to be regulated at all. They do. They very much do require to be regulated. It is vital that tenants can be confident in the knowledge that their homes are well maintained and their tenancy is secure. 
a strong framework also give funders of social housing the confidence to invest. And we've touched on that already, that there may be a lack of confidence to invest, and we have to ensure that that is not the case, uh, and that we do manage to challenge that and ensure that happens. So in concluding, presiding officer, we in the Scottish Conservatives are committed to strengthening building regulations to ensure the safety of the Scottish public and also increasing the number of affordable homes available across the country. We believe that the recommendations contained within this committee's report and the bill seek to address that problem. Our aim is to strengthen and support any measures which will improve the housing sector and in turn will benefit communities the length and breadth of Scotland. I support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I call out, uh, Kevin Stewart. I was going to say, call, call on Alexander Stewart to close for the government. Now, that would have been interesting. Uh, call on Kevin Stewart to close for the government. Minister, till five o'clock, please. Um, as long as you didn't call David Stewart, who's not uh, uh, present at the moment. But thank you, uh, presiding officer. Uh, maybe too many Stuarts, never too many Stuarts. <laughs> Um, I'd like to uh, thank those members who participated in this afternoon's debate. Um, I uh, certainly appreciate the consensus that there has been uh, around the cha chamber, and I, uh, I'm glad that uh, th they support the general principles of the bill today and the recognition that it is necessary in order to protect the finances of the Scottish Government. As you will know, presiding officer, this government is a clear and defining reason uh, for making housing a priority. Uh, providing good quality, warm and affordable housing is vital to create a fairer Scotland, secure economic growth and to support and create jobs. And at the heart of that sits uh, our commitment to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes over the course of this parliament, 35,000 of those for social rent, which presents a huge opportunity uh, to meet the various housing needs of communities right across the country. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we are making good progress on that commitment, uh, thanks to partners and councils and housing associations in the construction industry. And recent statistics show that approvals for new housing association homes are up 33% on the previous year, helping to lay the foundations for a pipeline of proposals capable of delivering against the remainder of the 50,000 target Now, uh, excuse me, uh, too, too, please sit down, Mr. Too much chat. What Mr. Stewart's saying is riveting, and you should be listening. I hope I can continue to be riveting, presiding officer. Maybe the heather will be set alight this afternoon. Um, let me be quite clear, presiding officer. Uh, the role of housing associations isn't just about providing good quality housing and services for the tenants that they have, or in just building new energy efficient homes. It's also about creating jobs, supporting vulnerable people, um, as Ms. Smith pointed out, and acting as an anchor for some of the most deprived communities in our country. And given the crucial role that housing associations play, I'm delighted that the need for this bill and its general principles has, from the outset, has had, had the support of the sector. Both the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations have acknowledged the need for the bill, not least to underline the status of housing associations as independent private bodies, um, but also that they are partners uh, with the public sector, uh, but not controlled by it. Um, they are key partners uh, for all of us, um, developing and managing high quality energy efficiency uh, housing across the country and delivering that range of services to their tenants that I've mentioned previously. But beyond that, they do so much more to build and sustain the communities in which they operate, and long may that continue. We and they uh, agree on the need for them to have a strong and effective independent regulator working on behalf of homeless people, tenants and the others who use their services. And one of the key benefits of such regulation is the confidence that it gives to lenders. That confidence enables housing associations to borrow at favourable rates, helping them in turn to play their part in delivering affordable housing. 
Maintaining lenders' confidence has been an important objective for the government during the development of this bill. And that is why we've been in regular contact with their representative body, UK Finance, throughout the process, and why we have used our response to the Stage 1 report to address concerns that they raised with us. Another priority has been to ensure that housing associations continue to provide information requested by anyone under the environmental information regulations, as has been mentioned by many members this afternoon. And I'm pleased that the SFHA and GWSF shared that priority, and I'm grateful to them for confirming that they will be advising their members to continue to respond positively to requests for environmental information, even if, uh, once the bill has been uh, enacted and brought into force, the Scottish Information Commissioner were to decide that the regulations could uh, no longer apply to housing associations. President Officer, I hope that these examples illustrate the positive and constructive approach that we and stakeholders have taken to the issues raised by this bill. I welcome the input of the Local Government Committee. I hope that that will continue uh, during Stage 2 deliberations. Finally, uh, Presiding Officer, I'd like to thank uh, the officials uh, who have had to deal with uh, what some members have said is rather a dry piece of legislation. Personally, I find all, all of this quite exciting, as I do all housing, um, uh, and I hope uh, that we will continue to see the cooperation uh, that we've had when we reach stage two. Uh, and I thank you very much, President Officer, for giving us, us the opportunity to move stage one today. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on the stage one of the Housing Scotland Amendment Bill. The next item of business is consideration of a legislative consent motion. Could I ask Hamza Youssef to speak to, sorry, just to move motion 11345 on the Laser Misuse Vehicles Bill. Moved in my name. Thank you very much. And the next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion uh, 11397 on substitution on committees. And could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Formally moved. Thank you very much. So we come to decision time. Uh, the first question is that amendment 11347.1 in the name of Rachel Hamilton which seeks to amend motion 11347 in the name of Fiona Hislop on Scotland's support for the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural, cultural Heritage be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11347.1 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 27, no 78. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 11347 in the name of Fiona Hislop uh, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 11350 in the name of Kevin Stewart on the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill at sca Stage 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 11345 on the Laser Misuse Vehicles Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And the final question is that motion 11397 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on Substitution on Committees be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. And I close this meeting. <laughs>